showcase, wasn't it? But we can do better with these applause if we feel like it. It also gave us a glimpse on how Orient Pro is set to be the next leading global tech provider. Ladies and gentlemen, now to set the context for the evening, I'd like to welcome on stage Mr. Ashish Rai, Vice Chairman, Orient Pro Solutions Limited. Ashish is a FinTech industry veteran, bringing with him an extensive 22 plus years of track record of building enterprise software businesses for global markets. And he guides the overall business at Orient Pro. So ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and welcome him on stage. Very welcome to you. Dive deeper into what we do as a business and, and then um, we'll obviously be able to spend as much time as we need to in terms of really long and QA and stuff like that. I was, so this is, uh, remember an episode from, from before the pandemic days um, when I, uh, out in the US, I just did one of these tech events where, um, you know, um, used to be fairly hot, but it still is. Uh, and um, I was talking to a speaker where, um, you know, my question was very simple. I said, okay, um, TED, I, I think the first thing stands for technology, and then there's hardly any tech speakers. There's people talking about life and diet and, and, and things like that, and there's no tech speaker. And why is that? And he said, um, you know, there's three problems with tech speakers. One is they tend to be really boring, they don't know how to talk. Uh, second, they tend, they tend to use a lot of jargon, what was the latest thing going wrong, even the little way are. Uh, you know, sort of top chain crypto, uh, composable banking, things like that, which no one really wants to hear about. And, and, and the third thing is they just don't know when to stop. Um, so problem number one, I can't do anything about. You stuck with me for, for, for the next 30 minutes or so, so boring is what you get. Uh, problem number two, uh, we will do something about. My goal is to um, really try and boil the essence of what we are trying to do with this strategy in very, very simple English, at least when we set the context for what is it that we are trying to do. Um, and then we will, we will try and stick to the time as far as the, the prepared section of this, this plan is concerned. Um, right, so we will, uh, a little bit about me, uh, I, and I can see a lot of people who, who, who met me uh, before over the last few months uh, that, that we were talking. Uh, I, uh, so I joined Oil Pro as an investor in 2020. I, I joined Oil Pro as an executive um, last year, um, coming up to almost 11 months now. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a fairly rewarding journey for me personally. Overall, I'll share some of that as we go. Um, Orient Pro has been around since 1997. Um, we, we truly stand on the show floor of giants, as I say. It's, it's the IPO in 2005. Um, when we IPO, we were um, for the value of about 10 crores, 10 and a half crores thereabouts. Um, we finished last year at 660, uh, which is a, a, a CAGR of something like 26%. Um, while we were in that journey, we also divested a number of, number of our businesses. So some of those to the right, uh, we sold the IDM business to KPMG, um, cyber security to a fairly reputed and about post point in the US. We demerged a, 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 a company called Rajhara from us. If you look at all of that together, we could be CAGR at 30 so it's, it's, it's grown over time, it has its, it has its phases, we've always done um, acquisitions to build out the product portfolio, which we've done from time to time, and, and then we, we, we were expanding around the services business um, till some time uh, before we started simplifying the business overall, right? So we started our, um, I, I joined as an investor as I said in 2020, and we, uh, we sat together and said, okay, we need to uh, really refocus the business uh, in terms of where it, where it needs to go. And then we started our strategic pivot in, in, in 2020, some of which I will share uh, as, we, as we go from here. Um, where are we today? Just to give you uh, some key, key sort of information points, uh, we are a products and platforms player that operates globally. Um, we are present in 14 countries. Uh, we have now uh, over 2,100 um, people uh, overall, and that's actually gone fairly fast over the last nine months, uh, where we went from something like 1,400 people to almost 2,100 now. Uh, and there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more very, very high quality talent that, that, that has come in and joined us from the industry. You saw some of those videos from, from actual uh, 
you know, uh, product shops across the world pretty much um, come in and join us in the journey to try and build the global products and platforms layer out of, out of, out of India. Um, we work very deeply with, with a select set of clients that is uh, almost a, a, a hundred of uh, most financial institutions across the world and a few private organizations, right? I, I will not spend a lot of time on awards and all that will come back to it um, when we are talking through the products. Uh, right, so so what is it that um, we started doing, right? And and um, to just really bring it down to the essence of what we are trying to do, the core thesis had just a few points, uh, right? Uh, one, um, we were doing a lot of services business, and we said we can't really sustain um, the the margins for the services business that will come down over the. When we were looking at it that time back, obviously the structural cost in, in the services business was changing. Uh, that would because the margins you would always see, you know, go on to GitHub and see the shared libraries, all this stuff, and you would see the productivity of an average programmer is coming down. Now, with obviously, even, I don't know, those of you who still enjoy coding, you go to GitHub and you see Copilot and you say, okay, that is just, you know, I, I don't need to be the programmer anymore, right? And almost any, any of us can do it. So the productivity of a um, you know, a lot of labor arbitrage that we were writing over um, that, that more of us seem to be gone if you're an average programmer can become five or six times more productive than what it is, right? So, so one is we said we don't want to be in, in the services game anymore. That's not for us. Uh, center the business around IT. So even when we do some services center it around IT so that we can actually drive better margins from it. Um, then the second thing is if we are in an IT business, we don't want to be a single product. IT business, we don't want to be a one trick pony because that exposes us or shareholders to too much emptiness in the ministry. So we said, okay, if we build IT, we want to have a portfolio of IT uh, as we go. Uh, third, if I want a portfolio of IT, we don't want to be restricted to one sector that we go and go about building that IT because, again, I expose myself to the cyclicality of that sector, even if this sector as large as banking is. So we said, okay, where else can I go? Even if I use the same payment stack that I use in banking, in transit, at least the demand is not correlated, right? So we can go to adjacent sectors which at least have an uncorrelated demand and build out our IP portfolio there as well, right? And the fourth very simple insight was look at the value chain, look at how does the customer buy. So we are not trying to sit in a box which says we are software or we are hardware or we are services. Um, we are saying, how does the customer really buy? Can I go and occupy every point on the value chain? And that is what has been drive margins, right? So if a customer is a bank and they buy software with cloud, we do software and service in cloud. If the customer is a transit organization that buys hardware to software to gates, we will do the whole chain. How can I actually occupy every point on the value chain? How can we actually become the most cost efficient producer at every single one of those points, right? So I think that was sort of a key um, inside that we're driving with, which is how do I really integrate across the chain rather than say I'm a software company, I'm a hardware company, I'm a services company, I'm an operations company, or something like that. Right? If I sell to transit, I sell to transit, I will sell to all the companies. So that was sort of the, um, we'll come back to it, um, the core uh, sort of thesis that we're working with when we started this pivot back in 2020. Um, we want to build a business centered around IP that goes across sectors, ideally. And, and that allows us to really like as many points in the value chain as we can. Uh, and as I as I go into this timing more often, I'll spend a little bit more time trying to uh, explain that. Um, so if we choose to build IP, how do I really choose the segments to come in? And that boils down to very, very simple things. Which segments do I want to be in? One, the segment has to have a long demand runway, that's quite obvious. Uh, you know, if you're building a business out for the next 15, 20 years, we should be able to see um, that demand environment lasting. Um, products is a very different business from services, right? I think, I think the, the important thing to understand here is, um, and, and the reason I make that point is bulk of Indian IT is, is all of us know is services, so I think we can understand that business better. Uh, services is a very linear thing. I sell a thousand people, I make thousand people of revenue, I sell ten thousand, make ten thousand. It doesn't matter what those people are doing as much. Um, product is a very different thing. I need to put a lot of capital up front to build the product. I don't know what my success rate is going to be, even if I have a very high quality team. When I succeed, I don't know what the scale of that success is going to be. So I need to be very, very careful when I get into building that product, right? So I need to be very sure about the demand runway when I go and build out that product. The second is, 
it has to be a segment which has fragmented um, sort of players. At least, at least the leadership is contested. So it should not be I get into the payment networks where there's a Visa and a Mastercard, and we go for a third one. I want to be in a place where at least I have the ability to contest for a global leadership. Uh, the third is it has to be an area where I can pick out a tier one asset, right? So because if I'm building a product, the idea is to go out and create a leading product in the world. So we should have the ingredients and the ability to go and build out this product. So as long as we meet those three criteria, we are in One of those segments we are in right now, corporate banking is one, how do we do payments in the world work, and, and we we'll look at that, right? But essentially just how do you actually choose that segment? And, and the second, um, then very um, simple aspect of driving leverage to, to, to give margins, um, I made this point before some of you know that we are actually a very profitable shop and, and, and there is a reason we can drive those markets, right? So first is, um, at the core is the IP, the product that you build out. Uh, that itself allows you to drive a, a very, I mean, that itself is a very high margin play and, and that allows us to drive it, right? So that's one. Second is, surround that product with a set of platform services that allows us to go after a bigger market, allows us to drive a higher margin on it, right? Uh, so that is essentially things like cloud services, etc. that we do around that IP. And, and the third that is, which is really a 5 to 10 year play, bet on the convergence of uh, these platforms coming in, work with other partners to drive the leverage on an ecosystem. This is our platforms like Pay. On the payment side, these are platforms like Orobis, which is a SME SaaS platform. These are platforms like um, Ravi, which is a healthcare SaaS platform in the US, right? So essentially, um, from an immediate revenue standpoint, that third level is actually not very relevant because this is a very, very long term play, betting on the convergence of platforms coming together, right? But that is how you actually drive margin in the space. I essentially have three levels of leverage on the same piece of IP, right? And that's that's how you both increase the market size as well as you increase the thing. So that's essentially what we are trying to do in, in, in very, very simple English. We extend the explain, you know, we say go after focus segments, build IP in those segments and then drive those three levels of leverage on that IP that you build out. Right. Um, so where, what are we trying to, trying to get to, right? So we're building out a global products and platforms leader. We started out in 2020. The goal in 2020 was to, one, um, simplify the business. We were in too many places, this is where we divested out the cyber security business in the US in 2020, we closed down a few lines, um, we, we actually shunned the business as, as many of you would have seen, and we said um, anything which is non-core, um, we stop doing, or most of what is non-core we stop doing, it doesn't mean we certainly stop our contracts and walk away, but to the extent that we can divest the business, we did, to the extent that we can close it down, we did, we simplified the organization, shunned the business, and we said let's focus on building the products out which is what we've been doing for the last two years. So uh, most of our core product build got done over the last two years and, and that is essentially the uh, 20 to 22 phase. Uh, and then that is what brought us to this year where we say now let's go out and see what we need to do to expand um, the sales for these products which is where um, we, we have a more or less brand new sales organization that came in over the last 12 months um, really um, bulked up in the US, uh, bulked up in India, bulked up in Southeast Asia, and Middle East. Uh, this, this is usually a, this is a team that came in with a lot of experience with other, from other MNC product shops, uh, and we worked on uh, fine tuning the product for the specific market that we are going after. Right? So once your core build is done, now we fine tune and we go there. So that is the second thing. Um, a lot of investment in the organization, which has been going on now, and that's why you see um, our headcount go up from 1400 to almost 2200 over the last three quarters essentially and, and that is essentially us working up the organization to get it ready for the global scale um, both the sales organization as well as the R&D organization and, and the delivery teams right so there's been sort of a uh, scale in, 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 in every aspect uh, get the structure more streamlined for scale uh, under the leadership of Shaker uh, for the banking fintech side and the leadership of Sanjay for the um, for the transit side you know we obviously you know uh, um, both of them in the businesses, we've actually built up a very strong layer of leadership um, under to uh, grow the business overall, right? So that's essentially what we are at 
right now. Uh, that's essentially what we will do for the next couple of years, go out into new markets. So our core base has always been Asia. Um, our core R&D has been in Asia, our core client base has been in Asia. We will go in and try and get as much share as we can in what we our own, uh, whether it's on the banking side, whether it's on the transit side, uh, and then we will uh, expand the channel out into US, which we've done, and we'll start picking up share. Right? US right now is 7-8% of the firm's revenue. Uh, that number will go up over the next few years as we expand, and then expand into Europe as well um, as we go. Right? So go out to the market. Asia will continue to be our home for quite some time, uh, but slowly that that um, scale will come in as we as we fine tune the products and expand out. Right? The final goal as we get into 2030 is very very simple. We've already chosen the segments. We've already built out the IP. We will build out the absolute P O one. Uh, best in class IP that can be built out. We will benchmark against the global leaders, whether it's a Pyrex, whether it's Finastra, whether it's Pfizer, whether it's Wix, whether it's Thales. Um, we will make sure we have the talent and the capital to really build the products to that level. And then we will, in each of those segments, get to the top three position in the spaces that we chose, right? So in the markets we are in, which is usually be the global markets. So that is essentially what we are trying to do, and that is where we expect to get to by 2030, right? So that's that's the game. Um, we made a lot of progress over the last two years. I was talking to some of you, um, you know, before we um, the, the event really started, and I, I can see there's some excitement around it. Um, I, I would say we just about started on the journey. I think we've done some poor work that needed to be done. Uh, but this is a fairly long play. This is the, it's, it's, it's not going to happen tomorrow, it's not going to happen in two years. Um, to get to a top three position in any large market takes time, takes stamina, and, and, and we have the determination to get there, but um, that's not going to happen over three months, right? So that um, that will take its time. Um, that hopefully, um, in kind of without using any technical jargon so far, uh, explains what we are trying to do. Um, coming on to the products, there essentially, so there's a lot of products and, and, and I've heard that observation before as well, um, and feel free to make it when we get into Q&A as well, we have a lot of products. But you know, the, the idea is this, I think uh, it's important to turn that around, um, come back to that point about value chain that I was making and come back to what is the bet that you are making. We have four large bets essentially that we are making. Bet number one is transformation in the corporate banking space. We believe, uh, and, and you know, um, Shekhar and his team, Shekhar will spend some time with you uh, later on, and you can, you can ask him as well, um, have done a, you know, have a lot of deep experience in the space. We believe the time has come for a lot of investment to go into the corporate transformation space. We have a set of products we believe are really, really strong in that space. Um, corporate loan origination for, for origination, for example, we have pretty much the leading product in core Asia. We work with um, the two out of the top three banks in Singapore, uh, some of the largest banks in Malaysia, some of the largest banks in Thailand, some of the largest banks in Vietnam, some large banks in India. Um, um, what tells me that the IP is tier one? Um, so Chartis, there is this um, analyst, which is probably the most respected analyst in this technology space, um, Shaker and team, you know, kind of, uh, Spend a lot of time participating in that list tech quadrant um, uh, maybe six or seven months back. And this is the first time we participated, and we are squarely in the leaders' quadrant. The only player from Asia, the only player from India, um, which is squarely in the leaders' quadrant on every product that we participated with uh, corporate loan motivation, collateral management, limits management, uh, each of those three quadrants, right? So that kind of tells you benchmark against global players. We are squarely a leader in terms of what the product can do, how deep it is. And, and, and the reason for that, again, we will we'll spend some time on it, but we have really spent a lot of time building out a tier one product there. Um, same thing with transaction banking, we've launched a brand new product about three months back um, in the digital banking space called Autology, which again, you know, we think the time is right for. Um, so there's a lot of investments banks have done on India side. Uh, there's not been that much on the corporate side in terms of bringing the experience together. We believe the time is right for banks to move that way, um, right? So, so that's um, that's bet number one. Um, especially as you know, as the world goes into 
um, a high interest rate market. Actually, there's a lot of talk. Uh, there's a lot of talk around the uh, Western world going into recession, um, um, you know, banking sort of slowing down the spend, which is probably true if you're interested in bank, you, 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 you need the M&A and stuff like that. But um, a high interest rate environment is not necessarily bad for a tier one bank selling or corporate loans, corporate loans, that is where you are making your money. And we actually see the spend going up when it comes to digital transformation in, in, in that space, right? So I think we, we believe this is a, a, a long sort of multi-year um, spend that, that, that will, will help us, right? The second major bet is uh, what I call smartification of mobility. Essentially, um, transit is a very large space. And in that space, um, so there, there, there are two sort of divisions, right? There's the Western world, which has a lot of legacy tech. There is the emerging world, which has no tech, or uh, moving from no tech to some tech, right? And both of those are moving towards what you call open loop payments. Uh, you know, the latest in the space, you should, you know, so you used to have a prepaid instrument, you take it out of the, the, the metro gate, and it deducts money from the prepaid and goes in. Uh, now you want to take your credit card out, or you take your Apple phone out and, and, and pay. Um, you want to do it on base ticketing, you want to do uh, QR base tickets, uh, so, so the world is moving there. We believe this is a movement that cannot be stopped. We believe this is a decade-long movement, probably. The Western world moving from the legacy tech to the open to tech. The emerging world moving from no tech to the open to tech, as you've seen, India is pretty much leading the way on, on those things. Um, and, and, and that itself poses a huge opportunity. What are we doing in the space? We are creating what we believe is the most integrated end-to-end -end offering in the space. So we're not sitting in a box and say like do we have some software or uh, or like do validators or we do gates. We've done acquisitions that were integrated into the chain completely. We've got we, we, we can play on pretty much every part of the chain. Sanjay and his team have built up in my head at least sort of almost an unmatched R and D capability to engineer things in the chain. Uh, and I should have made that point <laughs> maybe when I walked in, but if you really want to have a good experience out here, or engineers have a lot of work putting out some things out there uh, at the back of this room, um, you can see a validator unit there. You can see, uh, of course, you could not bring everything in, everything in here. You know, if you want to spend more time, come to our experience center, uh, either in Mumbai, Singapore, wherever, and, and, and um, we'll, we'll put on a, a better show. But uh, have a have a look at that. The amount of R and D it takes, and this is core hard R and D. This is, this is not uh, sitting in a, uh, on a computer and, and, and writing a piece of software and uh, putting a library from data. You know, this is, this is actual hard R&D and I think Sanjay and team have built up really a best in class R&D setup um, to, to do that. Um, last week in Barcelona, I think uh, we, we announced a, 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 a EMB card reader which has taken probably a couple of years for us to, to perfect and get certified and all that stuff, but you know, that's solved in proper cloud in Barcelona. When, um, when, when, when Sanjay and team launched it. Uh, right? so, so a lot of work gone into that. That's called ECR1. And sort of, um, so I wanted to call it products, but I just put one thing out there as, as it's, it's sort of from last week and better to stand out that way. So they can spend a lot more time explaining to you what the products are. The, uh, so just like you know, on the lending side, what tells me we have the absolute of one asset in the space? Uh, state of California, uh, 300 transit operators, um, they wanted to move from closed loop to open loop, and um, they went on a global RFP. Um, we uh, selected three vendors to do it, and we are one of those three vendors already rolling out in five or six cities. Um, so, again, you know, um, global competitive RFP, no choosing favorites. I think probably I'll, I'll ask them to explain that a little bit with me as we go um, or catch him for a day after this. Um, the, um, it, it's not an easy thing. There's no fixing that game. This is global competitive, every big player in the world competing, and we still go out and, and be a small, um, you know, transit player of Singapore. Uh, so, so you know, that kind of tells you when it comes to tech, uh, we can go head to head and win pretty much anywhere in the world. This is probably the more as competitive as any RFP gets, um, right? So again, this, the, the the same story. But the third major bet um, is 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 on um, what almost everyone in this room is is, is sort of very aware of. Uh, what we believe is a multi-decade uh, sort of digitization of India and riding on the growth of what, what happens in India, right? So this is where, one, we play in India with all of our global platforms, whether it's on the banking side or the transit side, and we've built up some very special capabilities um, which are very, very unique to India. So uh, 
uh, you know, uh, for example, your data center in hybrid cloud, I think we have here Roby Master Engineer in, 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 in the room here, you can uh, ask them after this uh, short talk gets over. Um, we built up probably one of the highest quality teams when it comes to that. And, and, and the idea is, um, it, it takes a lot of skill to get into data center design. It's, it's, it's not that, um, it's not that easy a field. So it takes time to build up the offering and the capability. And we've got uh, one of the best setups and we've got the bins to, to sort of uh, prove that. We also do a lot of work jointly with the government and some of the flagship programs that um, you know we, 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 we can't really talk about, but we have a very strong um, collaborative relationship on a number of common projects as well. Right? So that's essentially, um, obviously we build all our global platforms in India. This is our own market. We are not a service shop that says, okay, I get no rates here, so I won't be here. Uh, we really want to buy in new countries again. That is happening in this country. We want to buy into this transition that is happening in the country. And we want to contribute meaningfully to what is happening in terms of actual real hard capabilities that the country needs. Um, that's number three. And the fourth big bet, um, which um, we are playing, is, is, is essentially what we call co engineering, co building IP. Um, now, there's something very unique about Korean Pro that, that almost doesn't really get seen um, that much in the market. We are a product shop ourselves. We know what it takes to really build a product, how hard it is, how to go about doing it. We know what it takes to stand up an implementation team for a project or a product. We know what it takes to surround the product with a uh, API framework, make it cloud native. You know everything that goes around doing the product. It's not so easy for the commoditized services firms to get that. Uh, and because we are so bad, it, second because we have a whole portfolio of pre-built IP, we partner with several leading technology firms in the world. Uh, some of them we've announced, and now we've sort of instituted a policy not to announce the names there because of competitive reasons. Okay. But there's a couple that we've announced before, so I can talk about it in cast off. For example, again, you know, uh, the technology firm in the world, a very large uh, digital banking player in the US. Uh, so uh, the idea is it's so when you look at a typical um, what you call IT company in India, uh, and you go to their website and you look at the link which says partners, and you see a list of players that have and Microsoft or whatever else, it essentially says. I am a player, I am consuming technology from the Microsoft or the Red Hat or whatever to implement what we are doing. Uh, when we talk these partnerships, this is these partners consuming our technology. So, so it's, it's, it's being a technology provider to technology providers. This is a game that cannot be fudged. Um, I can still make a product and sell it to a random bank, but if I sell it to the number one trade finance technology provider in the world, I sell it to the number one capital markets technology provider in the world, um, they are the, the IP really needs to be tier one. The IP really needs to be very, very good. Otherwise, it doesn't. I mean, you're, you're talking to a highly mature partner who is capable of evaluating, right? So, but we are getting very, very good at that game. Also, with the transit business, for example, again, uh, you know, uh, partnership with Mastercard, etc. Right? So, uh, you, you're talking to buyers who are really, um, really in a different market when it comes to evaluating technology. But we are very, very good at it. We believe this. This is something very new for us. Um, uh, there's, there's this Sanjay Varma in this room somewhere, I think we're going to get catch him after this. Um, he, he came in from a fire to try and help us build out this a little bit more. Um, our core engineering teams have been building out part of this anyway, so I think we, you know, you can spend a lot more time, but we believe this can be very, very large as we build this business out and, and sort of collaborate uh, with the partners instead of, uh, and then we will compete where we need to, uh, but also collaborate uh, where we can. Right, with the with the global players, so those are essentially the four large bets um, that that we are making. Each of these, we believe, is a very very large uh, target market. Uh, there was there was one part. I don't know how many of you noticed. I actually ignored a TAM number which was there on one of the previous slides. So I'll go back to it now and talk about it because it did not make sense to talk about it before I covered the slide. Um, if I can figure out how to go back. Um, Yes. So, when it comes to products, um, we believe the target market is, is fairly large for the products that we are focusing on. That $11 billion number, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a number we calculated, you can challenge it. Um, why you will challenge it is very, very simple. Um, one of the reports I was reading before this um, was, for example, to transit. Transit, uh, somebody saying just the transformation that needs to happen on transit payments is a $30 billion opportunity globally or thereabouts. If you 
is a digital banking. Some would say it's a several billion billion. So we say why why do I use a much smaller TAM number? We sort of qualified that down. It's not a simple sum total of total market size of each of the products you make, but it's sort of a qualified judgment norm. Which markets do I want to compete in? For example, we don't want to be in that app for any business other than transit. Um, you know, uh, which which segment of the market you want to compete in? Which which countries you want to compete in? Right. So we believe it's still the eleven billion dollar annual spend um, that we can go after with the product that we built out. Similarly, when you add the layer of services we're after, that's a twenty seven billion dollar spend that we can go after. Again, you can challenge it. I mean, I was reading this last week. Some was saying. Just the amount of repurposing you need to do to traditional data centers to make them uh, sort of uh, repurpose them for generative AI is a trillion dollar opportunity, and that probably is right. But we don't play that game. So, so it, it's sort of uh, you say, okay, you guys do data center design and build, then why is that not the size of the market? Uh, it is not size of the market. It's it sort of we qualify it for what the game we want to play, right? So, but it's still a very large segment, and um, I would really hesitate to. To qualify for the convergence platforms, because then you're just covering the entire world, right? But I think um, if you if you basically one message you want to take away um, from that whole thing, when you look at these four strategic banks, each of these is a very very large target market, and if you're playing for the global field, uh, you will get access to a large part of that market as we go. Um, so that's um, essentially it. Maybe quickly. Um, since this is a investor meeting, and I, and you, I suppose people are interested a little bit in the numbers and, and, and what is going on, um, I'll cover this out briefly. Um, so, so we, uh, like I covered on the first slide, we've been growing. The, our CAGR is 36 percent, even after um, you know uh, a, a lot of investments and all that stuff overall in our history. We intend to keep that CAGR. So, whenever uh, we want, we share our plans. We say we want to grow 25 to 30 percent. That's what. It's not a number we we got our hat. It's a number we believe is the right number for us to keep doing that. Last year we obviously overshot that number, um, and, and and the revenue grew by 31 percent and and PAR grew at 35 percent. Uh, but that's uh, I would say long term uh, that's still a 25 to 30 percent trend. Uh, debt to equity um, is is fairly down as, as as all of you know. Last three years we worked on paring down the debt level in the business. It's at a level where it will keep going up and down a little bit, but we are very comfortable. At 0.14, we, we've got enough ability to add on the to the business if we ever needed capital for any opportunity. Um, we hold our each of our businesses to a, a a bar of delivering. If you use capital, you deliver to us at least 25% return on that capital. So that ROC bar, um, it will probably keep going up a little bit as we go, but that is very the very very hard bar we have, and I think we we, we by and large have been delivering to it. Um, and now, talking back from that pivot, uh, you delivered. You can see those lines. Uh, you know that makes for a neat chart. Uh, each of those lines is essentially the revenue trend. Uh, so, 11 uh, since the beginning of 2020, 11 quarters of consecutive uh, fairly good sequential quarter on quarter growth. Uh, it's 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 been actually pretty much within thresholds for three years in a row, and that's where we intend to. Intend to keep it. Uh, happy to sort of delve into details on anything um, as far as numbers are concerned as we go into it. So, just to share what do we hold ourselves against, uh, right, as the management team uh, inside Orion Pro, the goal is to always stay top quartile across some key metrics that we, that we, that we track, uh, right, and this, is, and this is where I'm talking about generate long term, this is where I want to be kind of goals. Um, right, uh, uh, revenue. Uh, like I said, we've last 17 years grown at a higher of 26 percent. I don't see why we can keep growing at that, given the amount of repurposing we've done in the business. Uh, we will stick to the 25 to 30 percent uh, for this year specifically because of the order book provision and all. We said 30 to 35 uh, in terms of the range, but materially it's not going to change that much uh, long term. A bit down margin. We will keep at so we finished this year at about 22. Um, we will keep it at between 20 and 22 as, as we go. Uh, the way to look at our data, I've explained this before on, on, on a few earnings calls. Um, so in the product business, you do need to expend a lot of capital in terms of building out products. Uh, but we are not big fans of adding on a lot of intangibles to a balance sheet. So 
we are following a policy reason, unless there is like for example also there is a specific regulatory reason, we do not normally capitalize, we need to keep expensing more our money. <coughs> that is going at a clip of um, somewhere near 7 to 8 percent, right? So, um, the way to look at EBITDA is if you are capitalizing, that's 20 percent EBITDA, right? But because we don't want to do it, we will keep on doing the expense, um, we will keep at that level. Um, someone, I'm pretty sure, uh, as we go, we make the point that, oh yeah, but as you get scale, your economics will improve. Uh, yes, it may, but we will use the excess and pour it back. So we'll keep the EBITDA at 20 to 22. That's the plan. Uh, even when we get an excess, we'll pour it back into R&D and probably you'll see the R&D spend go up rather than the EBITDA number go up, right? Um, so I probably, um, you know, it's easier way to understand it and the fact we will, we've kept it at 15 to 16 for the last three years. I think that's where we'll, um, we, we, we plan to keep it in terms of our goals. Um, so the, this, this next one is a pretty interesting one. So we don't really need to sell much to deliver our next 12 months of growth. That's the nature of the product's business. So uh, by and large, what we try to do is 75% of the incremental growth that we're targeting for the year would come in from the existing base. And we try and hold the metrics so that we're not adding on too many new customers. Uh, that's the point I was trying to make earlier about going deep with specific clients rather than having a very large number of clients because it, it's not really a, a, a great thing. We would much rather have few strategic customers with whom we are growing rather than have a very large number of customers. So that's something that person again is a hard bar that we do and, and capital, as I said, maybe the bar gets raised in the next couple of years. Um, but um, by and large, we will, we will keep the 25% when it comes to the long term growth. So that's, that's, in a nutshell, is what we're trying to do. If you take away two numbers, uh, revenue, we will continue to target growing at 25 to 30 over the long term. And I will we'll try to keep it 25 to 30 over the long term. Right? I think that's, that's essentially what we will um, so, so the final thing, so one of the, one of the questions I always <laughs> like asking every manager who reports to me, right? So, um, when it comes to growth, it's, 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 it's really, um, so growth is an aspirational thing. Everyone wants to grow 30%, but some want to grow at 50%, right? And you say, all right. So, so to me, it's a very simple thing. But can you explain in 50 seconds, you know, what really gives you the right to grow at that, 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 um, uh, really sort of 30% or 35%, whatever you say, right? And, um, so I'll probably try and do that test for myself and, and explain very simple terms what, what really gives us the right to go. And, and which is essentially a very, very simple thing. One, when I build out the tier one product in a very, very large segment, right? And I combine that with a, um, so I call it small market share, but I think they like it, so they change it to headroom for growth. Uh, but basically, you know, when you combine a very complicated global product with a very, very large market, uh, that product should be able to win, win sort of in the globe and combine that with a very small share that we are at. So even when I call CLO leaders in Asia, at a global level, you less than four percent market share in the space. You really have the right to go on. How can you not go um, right when you have that? So that is essentially uh, what I would want to leave with. Um, thank you for your time. We will spend more time when it comes to QA. Um, uh, the more the, 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 the questions are more interesting for us as we go, right? But before that, I will um, invite am I inviting Shekhar and Sanjay Bodhi for the panel? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashish, for that brief insight into Orient Pro. And I'm sure you want to learn more. The experience zone is here, and we are going to have a spotlight discussion right now, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to shine the spotlight on an engaging and thought provoking discussion. Something we are all eager for. As you see, the stage is also being set up for the same. Well, let's move to the next segment, that is the Spotlight Discussion. In this captivating session, we bring you the brightest minds who will delve deeper into the business and the way ahead. I'd like to first introduce you to our moderator for the session. We have Ms. Ruchira Sharma, a seasoned communication specialist and content strategist with over 20 years of experience in TV, events, and print. Ruchira will be leading our panel discussion today, so please put your hands together and welcome her on stage. Can we do that, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. And now let me introduce you to our panelist for the spotlight discussion. We have with us Mr. Shekhar Mulati.
President and Global Head Banking, Shaker oversees sales, operation and delivery across Asia Pacific, the Middle East and Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, Shaker Mila. Very well welcome. We also have on our panel Mr. Sanjay Bhatt, President and Global Head Tech Innovation Group. Sanjay takes care of business and government and public sector for all way
saying that they want to use our technology to grow you know, their business further. It's like you know, Apple choosing Foxconn, right? <laughs> you know for sure that if Apple is that good, Foxconn would better be that good too. Definitely, and that's how you're accelerating enterprise transformation across the world. All right, thank you for that. Coming to you, Mr. Sanjay, what is your major milestone that you'd like to share with the audience here? Uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really happy to see everyone sitting out here and more being with their friends of uh, all our investors and next year. Uh, every year, actually, every year was a you know, kind of event for me. I joined almost 10 years back. We started with, uh, you know, I was then given the responsibility to you know, start the government business. Uh, and uh, till 2016 17, we did everything eventful in the government, as Ashish was telling, you know, the digital part of uh, growing India almost 10 years now. And 2014 was something, you know, change of time when the new government came. They were more focusing on the digital side of the world and they wanted to take uh, India to the digital stride. Uh, we became immediately the part of the group. And uh, 2017, when we first won our transit business or the mobility business project uh, uh, with Nakhto Metro, we realized that this is the time when the world is moving towards digitizing the transit business. And as we were doing uh, there, the next, you know, as you asked for the change in path, we thought of that, you know, this is the time we should have something which is scalable, okay. which can grow at the fast pace. And uh, then we converted uh, something and we named TIG, Tech Innovation Group, and we created a service business line which just was not government, but it was cutting across all the verticals. So we thought of what to do. So we, we thought, yes, rather this is the right thing, and we are moving in the right direction, and which is a global scalable thing. What pulls us next? The next thing is everybody is moving towards data, AI, voting, platform, everything. Can we be part of that? No, oh, it's very difficult. Then what should we should do? We said, let's build it for you. So that's how, you know, uh, Bhaskar joined us from IBM, and we built it. Uh, data center platform, we created a data center business, and when we were doing the data center business, we realized what to do next. Mm -hmm. So this is, that should be the next year new thing. We said, who's going to take care of the data center? So we got into the hybrid cloud service businesses, we brought in another expert from this. You know, of course, it was a lot of uh, so discussions and a lot of things going on, so we got into a thing, and then we scaled up to the hybrid cloud services. So being in hybrid cloud services just not is for the office world, but we thought it can also enhance our existing platforms like you know what me and Shaker were thinking of collaborating and see how we can you know be my end to end solution to everyone. Mm -hmm. So we just collaborated and see that okay, if we are going to sell our IPs, we need to you know serve our customer with bringing them on the cloud platform or everything like that. So we, we got that other scalable product is our hybrid cloud services. Now, as you know, uh, the fourth part which Ash has told that, you know, we've been the part of the digital platform. Okay. I can't name many things here because we have gone by the end here, so we got into with the uh, government of India. And we tied up in many of the projects, some of them we announced, so I can tell you that we were part of the first Indian uh, digital platform creation uh, that was almost 2009, 17, just before COVID, where we went into uh, 3D city, creating a virtual city. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the specialization we did on the city platform and successfully completed the project. Second, we went into the next digital platform with government of India and even, you know, all the big, uh, you can say, ports and okay. the digitization of the ports. So we just went into uh, the fourth part of the digitization port. And of course, we are building many of the software applications and being part of many of uh, things which we can I can announce for the government. And we are building a digital platform for the government. So multiple milestones, not one. Alright, coming back to you, Mr. Shaker. The company has, of course, won multiple awards, many accolades. But being the sole Indian vendor to be recognized as the global uh, category leader in the Chartist Risk Tech Quadrant is, of course, could you really take us through that and uh, tell us more about that and how does it make it, you know, the whole proposition absolutely unique and 
pick on the others? Well, uh, you know, you, I think you, some of the answers uh, are, are in your question. Yes. Like, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, building a product, a technology product, is not easy. It takes, uh, you know, a lot of effort. And when you're investing all that time and effort, you don't really know what is your success rate going to be. Is it something that customers will actually see value in and buy? Right? Even though you might have put in your best efforts, best investments, uh, yeah, the, the failure rate in products is also very high. Right? Uh, and and uh, uh, the risk technology space is in itself you know, very wide in a space. The, uh, the, the recent years of the pandemic, the global financial crisis, you know, it's accentuated the importance of risk management. And uh, a uh, industry watcher like Chartist. So you know, Chartist is like the Gartner of this technology, right? Uh, and uh, they they go deep into analyzing every uh, every major vendor playing in this space. So we didn't know about them. Uh, you know, they certainly didn't know about us. And we got to meet them. And we were we were astonished at the level of depth they went into to try and understand what we bring to the table. And when they mapped our capabilities, yeah, uh, and they mapped it into what we call the leadership uh, quadrant, right? Of course, we're the only India-based vendor, we're the only uh, Asia-based vendor, but all the other players in that quadrant are multi-billion dollar companies, right? And they say, wow, if the industry expert sees us in that bracket, I mean, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, look, this is where we can go. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, come to you, Mr. Sanjay. Could you, uh, you know, provide more insights about bringing the RDST global RFP from the South Korean part of the conversation? That is also quite an impressive achievement. Yeah, of course. And uh, we were looking for scale-up in the global market and what better than, you know, proving their skills or proving your uh, things in the U.S. So, just before COVID, and somewhere around 2017, 18, uh, you know, I just want to brief about you know, how the US market works, how the US market works, you see all the beginnings, you know, building up on large, dealing with the $20 billion for multiple uh, years, you know, deals and they're working on it. But if you see the rest of the US, which is a big market, the small players were not, you know, coming up, or they were not getting in the right, uh, you know, kind of focus from these large guys and the Department of California came up and said that we can't be left behind. They are 300, you know, kind of agencies, small, big, you know, right from having a 50 bus project, 50 buses, uh, you know, to you know, almost 2,000, 2,000 buses and uh, light rail and other transportation system. So we need to, you know, change the culture and see what, how we can do these uh, traveling for the citizens. So they, they asked, uh, they published an uh, expression of interest for the companies to come and show their uh, technical capabilities. And that's how uh, we participated. It was absolutely thorough, you know, testing down because we were competing against the world. And uh, fortunately, we were being selected as among the top six players with our capabilities, our products, which were absolutely world class. And uh, we could deliver it what you know, people were you know, working on that day. So once we got selected, uh, there was a closed bid call, as you know, normally it does. And that's how we won the bid. And now we got one of, you know, we have already implemented seven out of 300. And we are the leaders right now, if you see. On this, we are the leaders who have implemented the maximum out of uh, in California. And the best one which, you know, I personally want to go is Anyham, which is Disneyland, of course, you know, where so many people are going to go and, you know, they will take their kids and when they go there and we find the validators from the Indian company and, uh, you know, uh, using them. So it would be a uh, fun and uh, we will feel very proud that we are one of the leaders. That's really, I'm going to plan my trip soon. <laughs> yeah, I'll get you discounts also. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. More investors will come to you for that. Anyway, coming back to you, uh, Mr. Shekhar, of course, partnerships are very crucial for any organization. So, could you tell us a little bit about the recent Finastra partnership and what kind of value does it really bring to the table? Uh, yeah, partnerships are, you know, 
really important for a company about scale. Uh, you know, where we are versus where we want to be is a big, big distance, and uh, uh, we want to use uh, you know, every viewer that, that you know, we can be able to get there. Uh, a little bit, you know, about Finastra. Finastra is, is a well-known, uh, you know, uh, company, but in the context of trade finance, they are the global leader. Six percent. Of trade, six percent of global trade goes through Finastra's platforms. That's the magnitude of their trade finance business. And for a company of that uh, market leadership position in that scale, they ran a RFP process, a global RFP, two years, yeah, to find a company that can provide them a risk. Because you know, trade now is all digital, it's, it's, a, it's a highly risky business, and they ultimately uh, landed on us and uh, selected us, yeah, after a two year due diligence process. Right. So it really gave us the confidence that the people doing, doing due diligence on us are product experts themselves for a lot longer than, uh, uh, than, than we have been. And, and so there are so many best practices that we can, you know, also learn from. Absolutely. And but, you learn from each other. Uh, uh, certainly from each other. But now, in the process of them now taking us to market, it, it benefits us in, in a few very key ways. First of all, whenever they're selling to a new customer, it's their trade finance platform powered by our risk management engine. Okay. This is number one. The second is that on their existing base. So Finastra is, is a long-standing company. They have over 500 leading banks with their existing customers. They're going to go back to those customers and say, hey, you know what? Use our latest risk management engine, right, to power your business and transform your trade finance business to the next step. Right. So there, and the third is they're taking us to geographies that for us will take either you know, longer time or intensive investment to get there. Like for, like yesterday, uh, I was on a call with Finastra and one of the largest banks in Europe. You know, uh, so it's really a, a very, uh, uh, you know, shows us upside on multiple dimensions, and I'm very, very excited about. It. And that was quite phenomenal. You know, it helps a lot. And now, coming back to you. Uh, if you could also elaborate, of course, the company has multiple feathers in its cap, but you've recently been recognized as one of the global partners of MasterCard and SBI, and that itself is also a big achievement. So could you tell us about what you really offer to you as an organization? Yeah, it's a very interesting journey for us. Uh, you know, normally, uh, I like you know, everyone you know, when we are in uh, Bombay, part of Bollywood, when a new hero comes into the space, every large director waits for him to see that how he's going to perform in the first picture. If he does it well, then you know they try to cast him in the next movie, uh, or you know, and then his value uh, increases. So similarly, my uh, uh, gave us the chance with State Bank of India. Uh, State, first of all, State Bank of India put a lot of trust in us when we we, we did the first project uh, for Nakul Metro on a true open loop, which we are digital India was moving as national using national common mobility card, the rupee card. So we successfully implemented uh, that with uh, SBI and immediately we got to one, the next one was Noida Metro. So uh, after successful implementation and uh, during the COVID period when the world was moving towards contact labs, uh, we did uh, the pilot projects in Latin, that is in Lima, Peru. And then we did, uh, when we were implementing the California bid, MasterCard uh, recognized us. Uh, we had, uh, we were doing multiple discussions with them. And then uh, we won along with them the entire country for implementation on the MPGs. This is MasterCard Payment Gateway Solutions uh, for Maldives. So we got the first entire country to implement not only the buses, but the ferry system only because you know, you know Maldives is pretty scattered along and all those things. So we did in Malay. And we are the first in the Southeast Asia who integrated with the MPGS uh, platform, which doesn't only accept the MasterCard, credit card, or debit card when you travel, but you can 
also use Visa, you can use Euro, or even you can use Amex card uh, to implement. So that's how, you know, we are now doing multiple projects with them, okay. and we got selected as one of the partners. Congratulations on that, and that's really wonderful. But, uh, you know, Mr. Shekhar, you know, so Mr. Ashish mentioned uh, that products are extremely important, and products and performance define any company's success. So let's talk about product launches. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit about Autology and what is its USP, what is the differentiator, and what makes it unique. Right. Well, you know, if you look at the digitization journey of banks, you know, probably the last, uh, you know, 10 years or so, the first phase, a lot of that digitization has happened on the retail banking space. Now, all of us as customers or consumers of banks, you know, we're used to a very digital experience. On the corporate side, that time is coming now. Yeah, all banks are, are focusing their investment and attention on giving corporate customers that same level of uh, digital experience. And we feel we are at the right place at the right time. So that, you know, uh, the, the, the banks are investing and that's where we have built our, our digi, which is our, our digital engagement you know, platform which will help uh, you know, corporates you know, have a great user experience, reduce their transaction processing costs, and for the banks, really make their customers a lot more sticky. So we're in that right place, we're in that right, uh, right time, we have invested in things like you know, UX, or if you have a user experience, which traditionally on the corporate banking side, people don't spend a lot of time on it, yeah? Because corporate bank uh, uh, you know, customers, they usually, uh, a lot of uh, bulk work, you know, grant work, so it's, you know, very detailed, uh, you know, you know uh, complex flat tables, so you, it doesn't naturally lend itself to UI and UX, but we have gone against it, we've invested in that. Uh, I mean, just yesterday we were with uh, one of the largest you know, banks in India showcasing what we have, and, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the Bankers were just globally. They said, you know, we didn't expect to see this on the, on the corporate side. Your corporate digitization is even looks even better than what we've seen on the retail side. Definitely. In fact, you spoke about user experience. So I had recently read a report which said that most companies have only really one shot to impress their users because now the millennials, the Gen Z, they want the best experiences at the click of a button. So definitely working towards an optimal user experience is pretty good for companies and thank you for sharing what you did. Uh, coming to you, uh, if you could tell us about your whole new product launch, which is ECR1, and uh, about also the market potential that it has to offer. Yes. Uh, of course, you know, this is one of the most, you know, the most hard and the entire R&D team and everyone stuff what Ashish was saying to create a product. Uh, it took us almost two and a half, three years to come around, and it's a very interesting uh, journey for that. There are in the world there are around about six or seven, uh, you know, players who have it, or they don't give. Like for Singapore, ST Micro builds it only for themselves and for Singapore, and there are a few more like uh, globally, you know, who, who are there who are giving this particular product, and it's kind of a monopoly on this product. So we thought as we are moving towards being an end-to-end -end player, right from having a, you know, a required issues platform to an automatic pay collection system, our own hardware, but the heart of the hardware, we are always dependent on a third party. And there we thought of that, you know, okay, let's create something, some product which doesn't only go into our own validators, but we can sell it to the upcoming people or they who are creating validators across the globe and not only onto the transit, but the next big business which is coming up is the non-transit part. That's, that's the edge of anything. When you get down to metro, you use a parking lot, you go to and you use a cycle, you use everything. So, you know, you need to have some product which goes into every aspect. So we created this ECR1. First of all, it was for our consumption for ourselves. So it's a product. So if you use your tap, a tap, you know, you can not only accept rupee, uh, but you can do for master visa, you, you know, acceptance. So it was launched in Barcelona. And uh, already we are working with the non-transit uh, part of uh, the business. It's like bike sharing and you know, parking lots. And in India, very interesting use case came up. And so 
somebody asked me, uh, can you accept the digital RTO cards? You know, you, you, the, our license cards or our, you know, uh, what do you say, RCs mm -hmm. uh, to check. We said, why not? You know, if that has been given, we can integrate anything with this. So this has become a very large, global, scalable, how much we can sell in that market or for anyone. So this is what we could achieve in this uh, product, which was successfully launched in Barcelona. All right. So definitely the opportunities are endless. But uh, since the company is enabling multiple enterprises to be able to grow and adopt and adapt to a new paradigm of innovation, let's do some crystal ball gazing. If I ask you, uh, Mr. Shekhar, what is your vision for the next decade? Or what is your vision for the year 2030? Where do you see the company? So what would you say? Well, uh, uh, you know, I, I think we are quite confident in, in, uh, in where we are going and also how we are going to get there. Uh, right? you, you might recall, you know, when Ashish was making this presentation, he had that Venn diagram intersection. Yes. We've chosen segments where there's a long demand one way. Yeah. Then we've chosen uh, those segments where the leadership is either fragmented or so that gives us a good shot at uh, able to receive position. And we've chosen segments where we have the, uh, the, the ready capability. We are, we're not thinking of it on paper. Our products are ready right, to occupy a tier one ranking. So we feel we have the ingredients. What we need to do is you know, step up our sales and marketing. Uh, yeah, and, and, and with that, get into a top three position globally. That's really what I see for ourselves. Great. Thank you for sharing that vision. Uh, Mr. Sanjay, what is your vision for the, uh, in the next few years? Yes. Shekhar and Ashish have already elaborated that you know, where we are moving. We are absolutely aligned to our vision uh, as an organization. Uh, we are pretty clear, as you know, Ashish has given a very elaborated thing, so I will not say much about it, but yeah, absolutely, we know where to go, how to scale, and uh, each of our businesses which we have taken, you know, the responsibility which I carry you know, on the tech innovation group, or we are collaborating with, you know, everything within the organization, yes. so we are absolutely focused and ready to go. All right, so bright plan for the future, with one last question before we wrap up this spotlight discussion, and I'll start with you, a quick key <coughs> takeaway that you'd like to leave our audience with all our investors with. Please buy our shares. <laughs> invest in us. We are Colombian based Kagoda. So when you invest in us, I'm sure you know we'll get whatever back much bigger. Thank you so much. That was quite candid and short and sweet. Mr. Shaker, what's last thing? What would you like to leave the audience with? I just think the timing is now. We're ready. Yeah, we 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 are uh, we are equipped. We're ready and we're looking forward to the future. All right, thank you so much, gentlemen, for that insightful discussion. I'm glad uh, to hear your experiences, your learnings, and thank you to our audience. And just to wrap up, definitely, companies need to pivot to growth and as we are doing today, accelerating enterprise transformation across the world, companies need to embrace change and adapt to the new paradigm of innovation to stay agile and stay relevant. And that's what Orient Pro enables enterprises to do. Thank you all, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion, and handing over to you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rishira. Thank you, gentlemen. I request you to please take a seat in the audience. Can we have one more big round of applause for that? So if you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen, just raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Uh, just a few feelers or rather hygiene announcements I'd like to make here. Um, please restrict one question per person. Should you have any more questions, we can connect during IT or also you can write to us at investor at oreopro.com. We will have that email ID also flashing on the screen as you can see right here. Uh, you can take a quick check on this email ID to 
just write it down. If you have any more further questions, you can discuss it during writing, or you can also write to us, and we'll circle back to all of you. All right, and for this Q&A discussion, I'm not going to be answering your questions. We have experts here who will answer all your questions. Just give us a moment to set up the stage for the same.
create a robot leader and there is no need to do that. That, that brings me to the second thing, the 10x game, right? We, we're not after the 10x game. Um, the goal is very, very simple. Um, so someone was asking me just last week, right, or a couple of weeks back, uh, we say, oh, every Indian IT firm is in the US, why you guys are in the US, why do you keep doing this stupid to Asia at all? Yeah. And, and the reality is, how many Indian products do you actually see in the US? If you, I don't mean software products, I mean soap, shampoo, anything. Today you go to California, you actually tap in, tap out on the bus, you are doing it on a public provider to you get with the payment stack behind everything else, right? Uh, it takes time, it's hard, it's a 15, 20 year play, it's, it's not going to happen for years, right? So you're going after becoming a top two, top three player in very, very large segments. We have to focus on the product, have to focus on the that time will come. There is no need, I mean, you're a 20 million dollar transit player, I mean, 25 million dollar, we don't declare numbers on transit, but you know, whatever it is, right? Uh, all together, we are a sub-100 million dollar company. Yeah. I mean, tennis is a big deal. You're going after very large spaces, right? I mean, so, so what is the point, right? So I think the goal is, go for leadership, very large segments, Let's see, the numbers will come and let's see what those numbers are. I mean, what is the point of putting a billion? Everyone, like every CEO, likes saying I'll become a billion dollar company by 2030. What is the point? You'll see where we get to, right? But we'll keep growing at the rate we say. And when we're ready to accelerate, we will come back, we will tell you where it accelerates. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Do you have any other question? We'll bring the mic to you. Please raise your hand.
So in that uh, position, you know, how are you planning to capitalize on that? I'll probably imagine that Sanjay start with it and then I'll finish it. Sure. Thank you. Actually, this is a you know, if you see multiple papers, multiple <coughs> things, you know, India itself is going to be around about 5 billion you know, US dollars kind of opportunity in building and India is becoming the hub of, you know, all these uh, data set platforms. So yes, uh, we have a very talented team with us and a very unique team which we have our own design capabilities of data center. Uh, that's very few have. And then we have the capability to implement uh, the design which we have in the data centers. And, and the third thing which we have is our consulting business on it. So it's absolutely complete stack on the data center business. Yes, we are taking uh, step by step on towards what Ashish said that you know we are just building our daily capabilities around it and we are picking uh, of course we are getting a lot of opportunities uh, on our way and uh, we are working with all those and one of the few things uh, you know a partner you asked for a partner uh, or a customer which we have right now yeah i think which are the customers and uh, going forward you know how do we scaling up this opportunity what kind of growth do you visualize so i said you know uh, four billion is the opportunity uh, you know kind of five billion is the opportunity of course, it depends on Pascal, you know, <laughs> how much it can scale up the delivery. Of course, we have a plan on doing it, uh, and we are moving at a very good pace. Uh, some of the customers which uh, we are doing is uh, Webworks Iron Mountain. We recently, you know, launched uh, and they announced it, uh, and they declared us, uh, us as one of the uh, you know, platinum titanium partners for them. Uh, we did five uh, data centers uh, together for them. Uh, we did you know, something with Tata, startup projects, uh, doing something for Yota. Uh, we did IIT Guwahati. So there's a list which is uh, happening out there, and there are many which we are about to, we cannot announce right now, uh, but there are many in the pipeline to do that. And one of the, you know, I cannot announce the name, but one of the very leading FRA. Uh, we have been uh, chosen to build a tier, uh, the latest data center for them, which has multiple things in you know, I cannot tell as much, but uh, that is one of the prestigious things that uh, Indian company has been chosen to design an Indian data center for the largest account. So that's one thing I can tell you. Thank you. Yeah, that's probably one of the most complex deals, that was probably one of the most complex deals in the market that Sanjay was going to be. Because so that's sort of really published our credentials in this case. I think probably I'll finish off the answer to that is Sanjay's business last year grew at 25%. I think the data center setup is going faster than that, uh, most likely, right? So it, it is it is really forming uh, growth of the data design. That's a great number. Any other questions? Please do raise your hand. Yes, sir, bring in the mic to you. Can somebody go in the back, please? Yeah, please. Yeah, recently got a license for payment aggregator. What is the game plan for that? When do you get started? And what sort of scalability do you think in the next two to three years you'll have? So payment uh, aggregator, so the question was about payment aggregator uh, license that we got recently. And uh, you know, I think you'll have to go back to that theme of uh, backward integrating into the chains that we are in. Uh, right? So payment business for us is a very specialized business. Uh, at a large scale, mostly in the market, yeah, I would say, you know, it's, 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 it's a questionable business uh, in terms of who makes money, who doesn't make money, and, and to what extent they can make money. So for me, chosen to be very, very strategic. Uh, we, our goal is not to become the 51st payment gateway in India and join the race to bottom margins. Uh, our goal is to help where we already are present expand the margins that we have or expand the share we get from the revenue by transit for example uh, we have we hold the business we we have the contracts we can play we can control the margins that come through it uh, uncontested spaces or less contested spaces for example b2b payments that go through our sme supply chain platform you know the uh, supplier payments things like that uh, so we will compete very strategically in the place the goal of the business is to help us uh, backward integrate into the value chains we're already in, right? And make money there. We will, of course, you know, flesh the business around. Uh, I think it's a great demonstrator of uh, what we are capable of as a business in terms of putting things in place. And are we 
API tool uh, has, has been able to do the whole noise. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very rigorous process. Uh, there are many more names who've been applying for licenses that are not ready yet for, for, for quite some time. Uh, our team came together because we always had the tech stack, of course, it was being we supplied with technology to other providers, uh, but getting the process in place, getting the operations in place, uh, and getting to that uh, in principle approval, I think that really points to the quality of uh, product, the quality of operations that we built up. Right? And we will be very strategic with the business, but it will scale, uh, it will scale quite significantly as we go. So that will be a little longer journey or maybe a year or so you had started? Because you so, are already entrained into payments. I didn't get the question, sorry. Right? I said you are already entrained into the payment part. Yeah. You make the software for others. You are handling the payments. Yeah. So as an aggregator, you would take a long time or you would get started? Uh, no, no, sir. It would take time. So we are already live with B2C in India. We are live with B2B in Singapore. Uh, we got the we got the offering up and ready. We will just scale in places where we want to scale. Right. And so would you go for licenses elsewhere also in the world or this India is enough? You know? I'm sorry that the, the mic is not very clear. I that. It's very faint. I'm asking you like this licenses for the aggregator business you are focusing in India only or you would like to go ahead fetch licenses elsewhere also in the world? So we have applied in Singapore as well for the for the licenses because uh, we we launched the uh, the SME platform or Rubies in uh, in Singapore, India as well as a couple other markets and plays well together with that platform. So that is a license that is still pending evaluation from the uh, monetary body of Singapore. Largely, we will be in Asia play, uh, uh, but right now at the moment it's it's essentially India and Singapore. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your question. Do you have any other question? Please do raise your hand. Yes. Come on, right, it's coming to you, sir. Hi, Ashish. This is Nilesh from Innovation Factory. I have a bunch of questions. I if you can give some flavor on the competitive environment uh, and some of your major strategic areas, what are the kind of players that we compete with? And Talk about a few teams and could you give something in terms of what kind of uh, competition we face? That's one. Two is uh, what I gather from your presentation is that we probably have a bunch of revenue streams uh, uh, from the machines that we basically provide. And maybe in some cases we account for revenues on a sale basis, maybe in some cases it's annuity spread over years. Uh, we have technology products that we sell and maybe there's good some bit of services that we also provide. So if you kind of really look at say the hundred million dollar party, if you could just kind of give a flavor in terms of what comes in as direct product sales, what comes in as maybe products as a service, some as maybe software or software products as a service, if you could give that flavor as well. That just really helps us to kind of see how the basket is okay, composed so, of. Yeah, so you got that. thanks, thanks for So uh, look, that's a a, a whole bunch of questions, right? So I'll probably hit a few areas and I'll see if Shaker or they want to add to it, right? Uh, competitive environment, uh, one, uh, it really varies depending on what you're selling, but on the software side, uh, for example, lending, if you have a look at it, we would compete typically with uh, the few key players who have a loan modulation system, mainly FIS and movies in most markets, right? So I think that's so typically you compete with FIS movies, in some cases you compete with Finasta, although they don't play so much in the Asian market from the CEO side. Uh, on the trade side, you, know, you compete with uh, mostly Finastra, Interact, players like that, right? So uh, that's largely the, uh, the game. It's usually the large global software players who compete on the banking side. Uh, on the transit side, again, they're usually the large global transit players, Travis, Wix, uh, you know, few of the specialized players. Uh, it, it, it's typically product shops, it's typically shops which are known globally, and the global players, they compete globally. Uh, on the transit side, we also compete more or less globally these days. On the banking side, we are core Asia. Right? So that's essentially the difference. Uh, among the other things that you uh, you look at, how, how do we sell? Uh, on the banking side, typically banks would buy a license. That license would go as an enterprise, would go as a SaaS, uh, would go as a software rental. Um, if you do a typical deal, uh, I would say just as a ballpark, roughly it's a third license, a third implementation, and a third AI. 
and say over five year period, right? So I think that's that's essentially how the sale gets done. On the transit side, it's a lot more complex game. Uh, there would be large long-term revenue share deals. Uh, the only thing to note there is, as an organization, uh, we've developed a distaste for capex deals. Uh, so we don't do capex. So we would prefer some one-off payments, you know, where we can uh, sell our units, and then it becomes almost like a software sale, um, right? So especially as we go out. Um, so like you know, like you know, Sanjay also explained it here. On the tech stack, we are completely cutting edge. We can go head to head with anyone. Um, on the balance sheet, we don't want to lie. Uh, right, there's no point, right? So if it's a large capex oriented deal, we'll partner with the MasterCard, partner with the State Bank of India, partner with someone else who, who can come up with the capital and we'll come with the technology. Uh, right? So so typically that will change the nature of payment because the capital deals are usually able to share. Uh, but when we take one off payments, we will just take that and, and we will run the agencies on it just like you want to consult. Right, so that's, that's sort of the thing in a nutshell. Any, anything you like to add? Yeah, so the transit, you know, in India we are there, you know, of course, we have a share, we sell. So, like UP, Mariana, we are doing a lot share. But when it becomes to, you know, Anto Metro, it was SBI who is much of the money, and we are the tech players. Uh, you know, some are partial capex and opex deals, so it's a mix of. Just needs to get skills 
what is the activity we get there? Let's stay focused. Let's stay focused on the products we have. Uh, let's do the incremental build around this. And for that, 7 to 8% is enough. Right? Three years down the line, we can revisit this question, or maybe two years down the line, we can revisit this question. I would think we will have enough access to up that spend without diluting the EBITDA. That's what I think. Uh, I will tell. Uh, we can have the conversation again in 12 months, 18 months, and we'll see where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Allow me to ask another question. Uh, Shekhar, you talked about this uh, this engine uh, bit that you entered with the uh, Finastra, I think. Uh, curious to understand what was the risk platform before you all entered and what prompted the master to change it? Uh, well, that's, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, so, Finastra, like I mentioned, the trade it controls 6% of, of uh, world trade, right? So, obviously, they already have a risk, risk engine. It was their own in house risk engine. And uh, what they figured out was that as the, as the demands for, for risk management became more sophisticated, the need to, to measure and monitor those risk dimensions was more granular, that their, their uh, own internal component was no longer able to do it. So they had two choices. Number one, to build a fresh one, or number two, to go and you know, find uh, somebody else who Right. And uh, in, they did that analysis as well, and they found they figured out that it was going to be too expensive, and it would take too much time uh, for them to build their own. That's that's why they decided to uh, look for a partner. And like I mentioned, to the due diligence uh, process and the total RFP, they found that. So, so you're saying that the reason to select an outside vendor was a combination of cost as well as expertise. Yeah. And was it just cost? No, it was first of all obsolescence in their existing component. But they could have chosen to do it themselves. Yes, it was cost and time. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Nastra is not just a market leader, they are also the fastest growing in trade. Right? As you know, during uh, the pandemic, supply chain and trade is really the flavor of the month. Right? So if they uh, laid out what they felt would take another three to five years to build a new component of that robustness and sophistication. It is probably not worth their time. So one of the reasons, you know, I think we bought into this whole space of licensing technology to other large global ISPs, and in that we are basically very selectively choosing only the top and the regional spaces. So who's the number one number two lending vendor, who's the number one number two great advanced technology vendor, who's the number one number two big advanced guy? And you know, just work with the big guys. But you know, a few things that I've seen, some of it probably my personal beliefs, uh, but I believe the really large players just don't have the agility to react to where the market is going anymore. So they are, you know, what, what does a large vendor have? Like if I was a finaster, you got the sales person, you got the account base, uh, you obviously have the balance sheet, you know, you, you, you got the brand and, and the client base, but um, you no longer, you know, you have less agility to react to where the market is. The need to preserve what you have is bigger than the need to grow. Um, and, and in the process, you know, there's a lot of urgency on the right like, that's number one. The second thing is, product is a very hard game. Getting the right level of tech, getting the product right, it's, 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 it's a toss-up. You could start building a new product today, I mean, and lots of firms do that. You think it takes two years and two hundred engineers. In reality, it ends up taking five years and five hundred engineers, and still doesn't get done. Yeah. So there's a risk, right? So it's not just the cost. You know, even even a player like Finasta, Finasta has been building a universal banking system for. I was there in 2006. We started building it with two hundred engineers. Uh, I left in 2004. It was still not built. It's still not built. Right. So it's 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 been thirty years. And this is a form with four core banking systems, right? So you know, you would think it's easy, but you know, it's a, it's really a hit and miss, right? So, and that's the reason why we also said we don't, don't want to build new products right now till we get to some scale, right? So it's a lot less risky, as well as you know, you are a lot more agile if you're working with a sort of partner like us. And we said that's good for us because typically, even with the pricing and even the markups, we actually end up making more than what we normally make, and they make the revenue anyway. It's a good sort of co. Oh, um, you know, he, he, he sort of co-create uh, sort of opportunity. Right? It will give us more success in market. So, yeah, uh, a bunch of things. Right? So, what will you mentioned there, obviously, many of the largest banks as their customers. From a bank's perspective, what will it take?
take for them to shift their risk engine to you from the existing risk engine? And what's the incentive to do so? Yeah, well, uh, so we've already started having a few conversations. Uh, as we speak, one bank, which is one of the largest banks in South Asia, and the largest trade volumes, uh, has already bought into it, and that integration process is underway as we speak. Uh, for others, they really want, you, you know, uh, a couple of things. Right now, they still want Finastra to be accountable for this new confidence they brought in. And because Finastra has confidence in us, they're willing to sign with uh, me. That's, that's number one. Number two, they want to know that this risk engine is not just good for today, but for the next five years. So these are typically the kind of questions that uh, you know we've been encountering with actually you know, a leading bank in South, uh, Southeast Asia, a leading bank in, uh, uh, in the Middle East, and you know, yesterday a leading bank in Europe. Thank you. Yes, we have a couple of questions from the back. Please. It's on, sir. Yeah. 
but our transaction banking business in Southeast Asia is not big. Right? Transaction banking is pretty big in India and Middle East, but lending business is not big. Right? Uh, so the, the question is, can we get a lot more strategic with, with these few? Uh, I believe we have some very talented managers who are coming from organizations who run that size of relationships and it's getting there. And then the other thing is also, so like Sanjay was talking about webworks and all, you know, there's some of these strategic relationships that are really scaling up in some specific spaces. And, and you know, the more we keep our delivery reputation intact and the more we widen our, our sort of, uh, you know, mature our solution offerings to the specific markets, I think that will happen organically. Uh, so that is essentially the plan. You know, just, just go wider within the clients you already have, and that is the whole idea of getting 75% of your growth from your existing base. It's just a lot easier for me to sell the existing base. You've already done the hard work for the last 10 15 years. Why go out and break your head against? Uh, you know, so we will keep getting new clients, but for the in-year in growth, we want it from the existing clients. Yeah, one more question. Thank you. Uh, geographically, if you can, uh, you know, just give me some idea of how do you see the revenue mix three to four years from now. Currently it is India and 60% is coming from India. Yeah. But the, based on the current order of work and you know the opportunity you see, how do you see this revenue mix? Because I believe that you know the margins are higher in uh, non-Indian markets. Yeah. So there are two types of mix we, we look at, right? So one is the mix between banking and TIG, the second the mix between India and the globe. Banking and TIG, it's 52-48 uh, sort of in the favor of banking so far. Uh, uh, banking grew 15% last year, TIG grew 55% last year. The hope this year is banking growth to pick up, which you know, has seen under a lot of build around the products. So the question is, we sell and accelerate that. And, and TIG, uh, Sunday is trying to show the growth out, so we'll, 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 we'll try uh, to converge these in the middle. Right? So slowly the share will change there. Right? Uh, that will also affect the mix of global versus Indian. Right? Uh, so I think what will happen is banking, because banking when it expands, it expands a lot more globally. Uh, TIG, the only business which is expanding globally is the transit side, right? So I think as that mix changes, you will see the global versus Indian mix change. Right now it's a 60-40 in favor of India, right? So uh, I, I would say, you said three, four years down the line, uh, I would say we at least cross the 50-50 threshold, we probably go the other side, right? Uh, but it really depends on the growth rates. If TIG continues growing at 50% plus, uh, I think that deadline will get postponed a few years, right? So uh, those growth rates between banking and TIG have to converge at the middle, which is what we are working towards. Banking will go up, TIG uh, will try to be very selective on the business that we take on. Uh, so, so, you know, as it converges, you'll see that changing. If, 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 if you know, yeah. That's basically the story. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Do we have any other questions? Now, welcome back to you. You have more questions, yes? If you have any questions, please do raise your hand. We'll bring the mic to you. Great time to ask questions because we have four more minutes to go. Uh, I think a few months back we announced this $80 million that we want 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Nanad. And ladies and gentlemen, before we move on, just quick few announcements for all of you. If you haven't already, then we invite you to visit our Experience Zone, which is right behind you.